Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to Foley is Pod. And of course, we couldn't do it without the Hall of Famer himself, the hardcore legend, and the star of the hottest single that's rocking the nation this fall. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Mick Foley. Mick, how are you, man? Are you referring to Mr. In Your House? I, I love it so much. I've been humming along. <laughs> it's stuck in my head. It's not only in your house, it's in my head. It's fantastic. And I hear that you're going to... Come through on your promise from last week, and we're going to debut another video, another song today. This is correct. It's not so much a song um, as it is a touching video. I have reworn uh, the cookie shirt that we referred to for people who don't know the story. The cookie is a tale of giving and love in which I gave up my dancing deer molasses, molasses clove cookie so my son Huey could have two. I never let him forget about it, and I always thought it had the makings of a Hallmark movie. Yeah. And so uh, I'd like to uh, premiere that. No one has seen this outside the family, a select wow. few people. And just the, the narration is mine, um, and this was put together by a friend of mine during the pandemic. And are we going to watch it? We're going to yeah, let it roll? Okay. Okay. In the spirit of the timeless classics, a miracle on 34th Street, a Christmas carol, a bad mom's Christmas, Hallmark Movies and Mysteries proudly brings to you a new tale about one father, one son, and a cookie. Now more than ever, this heartwarming tale of love, sacrifice, and the power of the human spirit it needs to be told. This holiday season, Hallmark Movies and Mysteries proudly brings to you The Cookie. One taste and you will believe in the power of magic, the power of Christmas, the power of the cookie. He gave the cookie to me. My dad gave the cookie to me. Huh? Bravo. Ah, uh, thank you. Thank you. Just working with a handful of photographs. Uh, I think it's... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step out. And I'm going to say, <laughs> about 25 years ago, a guy laid claim to a title that I think you in the last two weeks have dethroned you, sir, are the new king of all media. <laughs> Howard Stern be damned. We've seen movies. Yeah. We've got music. We've got audio. We've got the podcast. I just, I don't know how it can be any better. Uh, you know how it could trades. be better? In the spirit of the holiday upon oh. us, uh, gifts for you and Grillo. Now, I want to preface this by saying, I don't vouch for everything that has my name on it. Case in point, love pro wrestling tees, but I thought the Foley sneakers were a little clunky. I didn't think they were really high quality. That's why I never pushed them. You know, they were for sale. But this is something, the beard oil was something, uh, you know, for 10 years I had the giant beard. And yeah. it was only the last 18 months trimmed back because I understand that my, my full-time job is more or less making, trying to make people feel like they felt 25 years ago right and that's not with a big beard and i think they accept the the, the white and the beard is aging gracefully uh but this is something i use almost on a daily basis if i don't use this as i forget there's your bottle conrad wow, and i give this? this uh the mr silva slash grillo how about and, it uh it's tingly it is tingly i uh i saw that a couple of friends of mine uh Lady Frost and the Savage Gentleman uh, were promoting something they were in on the grassroots with. What's the proper way to apply this? Uh, just a couple drops in the hand, and then uh, and then apply liberally to the beard, and then I reply. I apply it to the dry skin areas too, which could be why the uh, the foley skin. Oh, is this so, is a good smell here, right? 
uh, the gentleman who uh, puts these together uh, at home, he kept sending me samples. I combined, because the beard is mythical beards, if people are interested in the Foley, um, Foley Yeti. Foley Yeti. Foley Yeti, part Foley, part Yeti. And when you look at it, it appears to spell Foley because the Y and the E are opposite. And yes. So uh, I had uh, said I wanted something with peppermint and vanilla. He sends me back a Nailed sample. It. I said, not strong enough. Another sample, not strong enough. And the fourth time, he later told me he was literally doing it just so I go, okay, that's too strong. And instead, I, I told him, I said, after the third one, uh, which was not strong enough. And I'm just coming from some guy who doesn't like the overly scented beard oils that tend to be woodsy. Mm -hmm. But again, I've got 200 hours of me doing manly stuff on video. And so if I want to apply peppermint to my beard, I will. Yeah. I saw I, you floss with barbed wire. With barbed wire, right? So, yeah, my man's stats are, yeah. you know, my bona fides or bona fides are, they're there. They are there. Uh, so I sent a message. I said, I want it to feel like you're getting hit in the face with a peppermint patty. And he sent me the fourth try. I said, that's the one. And it's their most popular blend. It's not something I talk about much, but a lot of the guys that I meet, uh, at my shows or uh, at conventions, they're bearded men. Yeah. And I think that uh, people know there's a good scent out there that I stand by and use that's good for the skin as well. They might be willing to give it a shot. So mythicalbeards.com. And uh, just through the magic of post, we've got a little graphic here. Oh, we do. And all that. Wow. Yeah. Okay, yeah. great. Great. We're looking good. And, and you're going to be looking good when you're raising some money for a great cause. Oh, yeah, yeah. This will be my last um, uh, Foley show uh, on the nice day tour, uh, December 4th. Unless I, I'm, I might try to get one in towards Christmas just because my wife has not seen the show and she's such a big part of it. But in this case, I was trying to free up uh, a day where I could do a benefit show for Joe Doring. Uh, he's an impact wrestler who's now battling brain cancer for the second time. We thought it was all done uh, six years ago. He returned to wrestling, which doctors thought he never would. He was a big part of that impact show and he came down with brain cancer. And I just, I couldn't find a free day. And I just, so I just took one of the dates I already had, December 4th, and we decided to make that one a 100% benefit, which means 100% of my proceeds. There's a certain amount that goes to the club. Uh, and I'm not in control of that, but whatever I make, Joe will get. And the Foley uh, shirt off my back auction that night, which hopefully we'll get a nice bid on, will go there too. And so we're hoping to raise between between five and eight thousand dollars, but more so than the money, it's just the idea that got people in the business are getting together for a good cause. I think Joe might be there along with Scott Demore. Joe goes for his treatment in the Chicago era, area anyway, so I'm crossing my fingers hoping he could be there. But if he's not, uh, we want him to know that we're thinking of him and he does have health insurance. But just as we talked about a couple weeks ago about money for Mongo, even if the NFL's covering it, it's still ten grand a month yeah. that uh, is out of pocket. It's a lot of money, so we're going to try to raise money and lift some spirits simultaneously. Love it, and we're going to continue to plug that um, on our social media, and of course here on the program. Uh, I just think it's cool, man, that you've uh, sort of become the unofficial spokesperson for uh, doing cool stuff in wrestling. Ah, and thanks, you should be congratulated for that. I know that we even talked about trying to get together that Dick Butkus poster as we're talking now we're right. we're right winding up or winding up easy for me to say our money for Mongo initiative uh we're going to close in over twenty thousand oh, dollars good good so really really happy that we were able to do that and hope that we can sort of and keep I, that could, I was unable going. to get into the storage unit couldn't find the key but um I will make sure the Steve and his uh and Misty get that personally yeah, I do want the Butkus poster. It makes sense to go to a great Chicago fan. Yeah. You know, um, I don't know when the next time I'll be making a New York to Chicago run, uh, but I'll probably end up doing it on a, uh, a virtual signing, and we'll just donate all the money to uh, Steve and Misty. It'll be fantastic, I'm sure, and, and, and whatever is going to come of this Joe Doring thing, we want to help on our end as well. So stay tuned to social media. We'll have lots of stuff coming your way on that. But today... We're going to be talking about something a lot different than what we talked about last week. We're going to be talking about Bill Watts in WCW. 
Uh, you returned to WCW for a second stint in September of 91. Coming in as a heel, immediately programmed with Sting. This is after Jim Hurd and his impasse with Ric Flair results in Flair being fired. And uh, we've talked a little bit about your interactions with Hurd. Uh, but talk to me a little bit about Bill Watts, because he's going to come in uh, May 12th, 1992. Did you see that coming? That I mean, certainly I think a lot of people knew that Boy, this herd thing isn't going swimmingly. But did you think Bill was going to get that spot? I never even crossed my mind. Yeah. Uh, you know, in talking to JR and uh, people who had learned under the Bill Watts tree, uh, they spoke so highly of him, especially yes. his flair for episodic television. Eddie Gilbert had learned a lot from uh, Bill Watts, and Betty, Eddie was one of the great storytellers and characters. And if he had stayed alive, like we said in an episode dedicated to Eddie, oh, no telling what he would have done. Yeah. You know, his contributions to the business. But I had always heard great things about Bill as a guy who was, you know, he was his son, I think Micah was his son who did the great videos, uh, or maybe it was Joel Watts who did the great videos for Mid South Wrestling and uh, the flair for storytelling. And it's breaking down. JR had that famous call. Way back when, it's breaking down in Tulsa. I think they did TV tapings out of the Tulsa Boys Club. Mm -hmm. And so they were big on cliffhanger endings and uh, uh, episodic TV. And so when I heard that Bill was coming in, I was excited, but a little nervous as well. So uh, I read, and I don't know if this is true, that you once had an offer from Bill Watts territory to come in there? I didn't. I did not have an offer. What I had uh, was a couple of people who believed that I could do You'd be well. his, cup of tea, his cup of tea. Yeah, yeah. So I had uh, worked with Shane Douglas. This is going back to November of 86. So Bill Watts, for a little historical perspective, uh, you know, a lot of his biggest towns were uh, oil towns. Yeah. So when the oil boom was on, business was good. When oil was down, business could be really tough. But Bill had this amazing uh, syndicated television show and that was reaching areas that they'd never even worked in before. And so part of that was Ohio, Western Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and uh, Dominic Ducci ran shows. Ohio and West Virginia were so much easier because there was no athletic commission. Mm. And so it was a lot easier to put together a show. And on those first four or five shows, uh, Dominic had me and Shane Douglas uh, opening the shows. And we had good matches. We always had good matches. And we, especially by the standards of the time. Right. It was not as difficult to steal a show as it is now. But Shane and I worked really well together. We'd really resolved to working hard together to do the best matches we could. It's funny because I remember Missy and Eddie were driving by, driving down the road. And Shane and I had gone out to get to, you know something to eat, and they saw us walking on the sidewalk, and not only knew that we were talking over high spot, but knew which high spot it was. <laughs> it was the kip up, Enzugiri to the back of the head. I think it was Enzugiri, uh, followed by the hangman, which was pretty spectacular. Big time yeah, spot. big time spot. Um, so they knew not only we were calling a spot, but which Eddie could tell which one it was by the body language. Fantastic. And, oh, and then, so after I had the matches with Shane, when the guys came back in either January or February of 87, they put me with gentleman Chris Adams mm -hmm. on the last night. I don't know if it was Chillicothe, but it was a good wrestling town in Ohio. It was, still to this day, has some great wrestling towns. And uh, I wrote about it in Have a Nice Day saying I was literally like getting jittery and shaking because I'd never had a crowd react to a match like that. I mean, just good sound, fundamental storytelling and working a hold. And Chris Adams was really over with that crowd. And we had a really good match. And that showed the, you know, I guess Bill, the report was that this guy's ready to, to do something. And uh, now right about that time, he sells to uh, Jim Crockett Promotions. Mm -hmm. So I would have to find out when the sale was done. 
87. Uh, okay, so it was 87. So this is, there was a- Maybe April? Yeah, so probably this is just about the time that it has been sold. So I remember, ter remember Terry Taylor saying, you'd be a great middle heel for us. So nobody was thinking this guy's gonna work the top of the card, but that would have been a heck of, I mean, I was, I was not even out of college right. with the first time they saw me. I didn't graduate college until uh, May of May of 87. And here I am while other students are going to spring break. I'm working Chris Adams in front of 1400 people in a gym that's shaking with the reaction. And I'm getting the buzz, you know, that I could be somebody, you know, for Watts in the future. So a about that time the sale is going through, probably March or April, I could look back and try to find out. Um, uh, UWF, they changed their name from Mid-South mm -hmm. to Universal Wrestling Federation so that it would be seen as a you know more of a, a national or even a global company. Um, I'm paired, I'm put on a Jonestown, Johnstown, Pennsylvania, which is still Western Pennsylvania. Um, Johnstown, Pennsylvania, a card with uh, Cactus Jack against Sam Houston. To this day, I don't know if I could not talk to Sam because physically it was not a possibility or because that's just the way that Watts' company did things where you didn't have baby faces and heels talking with each other. I don't know, but I did not talk to Sam or even meet him before I went out to the ring. I did ask Michael Hayes if he had any suggestions for me and he says you know the women love sam he's a great worker he likes to work fight from underneath so maybe something like a bear hug you know at that time you know you put on a hold it wasn't seen as a rest spot. right it was seen as a way to get the fans you know it's highly effective and still is when used right and so sam and i had some good chemistry right off the bat you know, classic baby face some people say he was the best worker of all the you know, the Smith family, which includes Jake and, and his sister, uh, Robin. But he was a really good worker and really str fought well from underneath. And when I went to shoot him in for a bear hug, I call bear hug. And to this day, Sam remembers it as well as I do. He says, watch the elbow. And I remember as he says that, as he's going off to the other ropes, I'm thinking, watch it do what oh god and i don't i don't know that what he's saying is i i, I maybe he said duck the elbow but i heard watch some sam comes off with a flying elbow that misses me by is that a foot at least a foot and i took a bump anyway hmm. and as soon as i heard the groans i realized very much that my stock had just shrunk with uh, UWF and I had the presence of mind to get back on him, get some heat back. By, but by the time the match was done, the damage was done yeah. as well. So there was a lounge at the hotel by the airport and I remember just being despondent, like really despondent because I'd just blown my chance. And uh, Brian Hildebrandt later went on to manage and wrestle and referee as Mark <laughs> Curtis. He tried to cheer me up by telling me a story of a popcorn box in a battle royal, which is a guy waiting to be the one of the last two, and it's going to be some type of bump that knocks him over the top rope. Instead, a fan threw a box of popcorn, hits the guy in the head, he takes the bump over, kills the town, right? It's going to, it, it did cheer me up a little bit, but not enough to make up for the fact that I just set my own career back by a year. Probably, you know, wow. I think if I had performed well uh, in Johnstown and not made that mistake that I may have landed a job in that transition time. Uh, and then I didn't and did not end up getting a full time job until over a year and a half later, July, uh, July of 88. Did you meet Bill? August of 88. I did not meet Bill. He wasn't there. Um it wasn't a full-fledged UWF card. It would be uh, on, on that card. I mean, it was the uh, Michael Hayes. I really, uh, Buddy Roberts was still there. Chris, I don't think, or I don't, I'm not sure if Chris Adams or Terry Taylor were on that loop. But I remember, you know, driving around with them, and uh, you know, I had a '79 Fairmont that wouldn't start sometimes, you know, or it would stop working, and I'd have to get off on the side of the road. 
with a screwdriver on the solenoid, things I could never do now right. because the whole uh, apparatus has changed. But at that time, I could restart my car. And I remember uh, T- Terry saying, that, you know, I had the uh, $10 car with the $1,000 stereo, which is about, so I could definitely, a little, little story for you here, little oh, unknown story, because as we record this, I will be talking tomorrow with a member of the Armstrong family. So in, I think it was like July of 86, um, I was one of those guys who's going to pick up the, uh, the wrestlers coming in. Again, this is that kind of gray period where um, Crockett has purchased UWF. I don't know what they were doing as far as it should have come down to a Super Bowl of wrestling type thing. It was probably a missed opportunity, just like the invasion. Angle. Yeah, the invasion angle with uh WCW was a missed opportunity, but I remember they had a strong card. So it was Dusty and the Horsemen on top, and Steve Dr. Death Williams was on the card, which is why I know, you know, UWF guys were there. And also the Lightning Express, Tim Horner, uh, Brad Armstrong. And I picked them up at the airport, and uh, Brad about, you know, Brad's one of the, was one of the funniest guys and best technicians we've ever had in our business. Uh, but he's, ah, I said, uh, what's wrong? And he goes, I don't have my, uh, we don't have our music. And uh, and he says, ah, oh, man, you know, left the cassette behind. And I said, well, what's your music? He goes, ah, oh, you wouldn't have it. He said, try me. I said, he said, it's uh, Train Train by Blackfoot. And I go, there you go. Big, <laughs> big Blackfoot fan. So the Ricky Rattlesnake Medlock has played with Leonard Skinner for the last 20 years or so. Yeah. But, uh, you know, he had uh, his band was Blackfoot and their big hit was Train Train. And I had it on cassette. Blackfoot Strikes was the name of the album. And he'll never, ne- he never, remember Tim never forgot that I was the guy the first time they met. What do you remember at Cactus Jack? I remember he had Train Train on cassette. Sure yeah. is. And now a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. Have you ever had a problem in your life where maybe you focused more on the problem rather than the solution? Maybe it was a problem at work. Maybe it was a problem at home. Well, what if you went into that situation with a different mindset? You see, it can be tough to train your brain to stay in problem solving mode when you're faced with some sort of challenge in life. But when you learn how to find your own solutions, man, there's just no better feeling. A therapist can help you become a better problem solver, making it easier to accomplish your goals, no matter how big or small. Now, this is something that I've personally worked on. Uh, I started therapy in 2006. I think it would have been February or March. Fantastic experience for me. I highly recommend therapy. Uh, if you're not sure if it's for you and listen, here's the reality. It's guys here talking. I understand that sometimes We think we're supposed to shake it off, man. That don't work. Not for real. Therapy does though. It helped me. And, uh, it's gonna help you feel more like yourself. You're gonna see some benefits. Maybe you're less stressed. Maybe you're more confident. Uh, maybe you just need some emotional healing. Maybe you struggle with anxiety or depression, whatever it is, man, therapy can help. And if you're thinking of giving therapy a try, better help is a great option. It's convenient. It's accessible. It's affordable. And it's entirely online. You get matched with a therapist after filling out a brief survey, and you can even switch therapists at any time. So when you want to be a better problem solver, therapy can get you there. Visit betterhelp.com slash Foley today to get 10% off your first month. That's better H-E-L-P.com slash Foley. Betterhelp.com slash Foley. So talking about Watts, uh, you're here in WCW, of course, Jim Ross has been there for a few years since the whole Watts territory is purchased. He finds himself in a good spot with Crockett. And now as a result of that, he's one of the lead voices in WCW and doing a phenomenal job. What was your relationship like with JR when you came back in 91? It was really good. JR and I had kept in touch uh, during my time away from WCW. I think he was all for my return when I came back. Uh, praised me strongly, and uh, I think it was really good at that time. It was always good. I always counted on Jim to tell that story of what I was doing in the ring, and sometimes I had ideas I would bring to him, but even if I did not, you know, he just had that knack 
for bringing those stories to life on, on screen. When the announcement is made that Watts is coming in, it's said that a committee, the executive committee, will report to him. And that includes names like Dusty Rhodes, Jim Barnett, Tony Schiavone. Uh, what did you? What was your relationship like, if, if anything, in 92 with Dusty? It was good. Because Dusty had brought me in in 1991 uh, for my second run, which was the really good run. Mm-hmm. And, um, I mean, it was... It was just a case of being in the right place at the right time. I had gone to a WCW house show at uh, uh, Nassau Coliseum. Uh, I think it was a WCW house show. I mean, I think it was Nassau Coliseum. And I remember talking with uh, Magnum and watching the matches and being pleased that some people there you know, knew who I was. But it wasn't until I came back and I went as a... I mean, I was a wrestler, but I was part of the John Arizzi you know, weekend bus tour, you know, bus, uh, bus tour to uh, uh, the Baltimore Arena, which is where they had their Great American Bash. This is the night that uh, they did the double turn with uh, Luger becoming heel and Wyndham becoming a baby face when Harley turned on Lex Luger. But it was, this is the same, also the same night that I happened to be on hand when DDP took the, uh, <laughs> Tom Zank attempted to, throw DDP over the top rope and it didn't work out. And then DDP attempted to throw himself over the second time, which would come back to haunt him, especially when uh, stunning Steve Austin and I were traveling with him. Um, But I, I, get me back on track here, Conrad. Well, I was asking about Dusty. Oh yeah, yeah, okay. So I come back, so Barry Windham sees me afterwards and he said, you might want to talk to Dusty, you might end up getting a job. Mm. And I did, that was the first time I talked to Dusty, and it's a surreal experience. Because even though I didn't get TBS until 83, like I was, uh, or maybe it was 84, I was really aware of Dusty through the magazines, uh, through his uh, couple of W uh, Madison Square Garden appearances over the years. I don't go back as far as 77 when he wrestled superstar Billy Graham, but I remember him coming in in 82 or 83, and it's like, this guy is completely different than anything I've seen, and then, you know, becoming a student of the game and, and somebody in the business, you know, Dusty was a larger-than-life character, and I'm getting to meet him firsthand. When I come in, like under his direction, he's the guy that gives me the big push, decides I'm not going to be a guy who's in here for six weeks and leaves. And, you know, and I tell that story, might be slightly exaggerated, but I believe it in my head, right. which is that DDP went up. This is where the uh, embellishment might come in. It might just be that DDP said, you really need to take a look at this guy's promos. But in my head, it was Dusty coming down to observe the promos. I do know for a fact whether it was that day or whether I'm just dividing these, you know, three, three interactions into, you know, the same situation that Dusty put his hand on me and said, "I think we're going to keep you around here for a little while." He definitely said that. Whether it was in the the while I was cutting promos at Center Stage, I can't be sure. But Dusty was the guy who made the call that I would be around um, for a while. And and you were. And I was. Uh, What about Jim Barnett? I did not have much interaction with Jim Barnett. He was like on the list of like five or six people I absolutely had to meet. Uh, I can't remember who came up with the list. It may have been Robert Fuller, but Bill Watts was on that list. Mm -hmm. Uh, Bill Watts was on the list. Jim Barnett was on the list. I'll come up with the rest of the list, but uh, Barnett, you know, oh my boy, I remember, you know, th- you know, everyone, everyone back has in the day an impression. had an impression of Barnett, and uh, I said Robert Fuller told me that uh, you were one of the guys I had to meet. He goes, did you know that at one point Robert Fuller was the most handsome man in this business? So Jim Ross can do a much better Barnett oh, than yeah. I can, and I remember the only other time really talking to Barnett was that he reprimanded me for you know spitting loogies on fans. And I was like, Mr. Barnett, I, I wasn't spinning a loogie at the fan. I was just explaining I would launch it as high up as I could with the intention of catching my own loogie in my mouth. 
uh, which I was good at, better than Bubba Ray when he tried and to steal it. left an impression that. on me to see. I did it in Montgomery, <laughs> Alabama. I was like, I was a young man. My dad took me to the matches, and I saw it and thought, I don't know if that's the grossest or the coolest thing I've ever seen, but I'll never forget it. <laughs> when I went for my first tour of uh, Japan for All Japan, here I was. I was taking bumps into the crowd almost every night because I thought you could without any legal ramifications. Right. And then I was told, you have to stop. You know, you can't. <laughs> like, one thing for Brody to punch fans, it's another thing for them to be landed on, uh, you know, during during a show. It's one thing if you don't run away from Brody or Hanson and you take a wallop. It's another to be sitting ringside and find me in your lap coming full speed at you because I thought that's what fans liked. Yeah. But after a month on the road uh, with All Japan, the thing I was best known for was that spot. And there's a great photo. It would be what a what a um, catch it would be if we could actually find this photo. But it's it's every fan in the photo looking up in the air with like shocked admiration and me about to <laughs> probably I had about an 80% conversion ratio with the loogie but on that night apparently it was an outside door the loogie went wide left hit a fan there were complaints and i had to explain to mr barnett uh it wasn't what he thought and he said despite that fact no more loogies in the ring i hope that was a sign in gorilla <laughs> like a few years ago they said no more leg slapping <laughs> now no more loogies just for you no probably. Um, i'm thinking it just to the top of my head, a Lex Lugie character. Oh, tremendous. <laughs> Lex Lugie, yeah. It writes There itself. should have been like a garbage pail kid for wrestling, <laughs> and he could have called him Lex, Lex Lugie. Lugie. <laughs> That'd be tremendous. <laughs> Maybe that could be next week's song. Let's think about it. So let's talk about Tony Schiavone. All right. Years before Butts and Seats. Yeah. Here he is. He's going to be on the executive committee in 92. Uh, an, an old holdover from the Crockett territory. Yeah. He's been here for 10 years or so. Uh, what was your relationship like, if anything, with Tony Schiavone back then? Well, it was good. Yeah, I remember it was good and solid to the point where um, when I was doing the Lost in Cleveland vignettes, uh, Tony even brought his, uh, his son to one of the tapings, and his son was called Mickey at the time. And he was, And Tony was such a huge Yankees fan. I remember. I don't know if I ever followed through with my intention to get him a Thurman Munson jersey, or if it was just a good intention. But either way, that's something we shared. Son was Mickey. We both loved the Yankees. Loved Thurman Munson, and I thought he was a hell of an announcer. Yes. You know, he only had that one year with WWE, and I think that was more because of the logistics. You know, when you're on, Lois didn't like living in New York. Yeah, it's tough. For, probably was she in Connecticut or? Yeah, she was in Connecticut. Yeah, when versus, you uproot somebody from the south and bring yes. them to the cold north, and you're up there and you're working almost every day with a house full of young kids. Yeah, no yeah, help. Blah so, blah blah. Yeah, I really respect his decision to say, "No, nah, I'm going to thank you for the opportunity, but I'm going to go back." And I always liked Ter Tony as an announcer. You know, it was fashionable for a while, I think, to downplay his. Uh, his role, but, uh, but look at him now. Look at him. Maybe now. the most beloved announcer in wrestling right now. Uh, let's talk about Kip Fry. He's not going to be with the company much longer. <laughs> Once Watts is in, he realizes, okay, I don't really have any power, so I'm out of here. Yeah, he's just essentially reassigned in the Turner organization underneath Jack Petrick, and that creates an opportunity for Jim Ross to move up. Before we talk about that, did you meet Kip? What did you think? Oh, of sure, that? man. Kip was in legal, right? Yeah. And then Kip, you know, he was known for the contracts that he was signing people to, like extensions on contracts, big bumps in pay. So people got in his ear, were making an extra 50 or 100 grand or getting an extra two years on their contract. And uh, I've already given props to Kevin Nash, you know, in his podcast. Just, you know, Kevin has a different way of looking at things than me. Uh, he can be a little more forceful in his uh, objections than I tend to be, but one of the funniest guys, you know, that our business has For ever sure. seen. And I remember, remember DDP going, you know what the great thing about Kip is, is he's available like for phone calls in a way that, uh, you know, uh, uh, other guys have not. And then Kevin just says deadpan, you know what's great about Kip is that he's sexy in a shy way. <laughs> what a great line. <laughs> So it was. He was seen as a guy uh, that was very favorable to wrestlers. This was 
before Bill or after Bill? Once Bill comes in, yeah. Kip says, I'm out. I'm out. And then Bill... Uh, goes the other way with those goes contracts. Goes the other way where I believe, you know, at least the rumor was, Bill was rumored to be getting a percentage of the... What he saved. What he saved. And so right off the bat... Uh, Just time out real fast. I okay. want to end this context. WCW was yet to turn a profit. Okay. So from when Ted Turner took over and purchased the Crockett organization... They're operating in the red to the tune of millions of dollars a year. Supposedly, they want to write that, and they want to write the ship. So now with Herd out, they're looking for a new leader, and allegedly one who maybe could right-size the budget. Mm -hmm. So in comes Bill Watts with a totally different approach yeah. to how to compensate the wrestlers from Kip Pry or even Jim Hurd. And, well, here we are. Yeah, so when my... Bill was there from May 92 until when? Do we know that? He doesn't last long. He's going, uh, but by 93, he's out of there. Now, so I do know Bill, it wasn't so much a renegotiation as it was just a, we'd like to keep you on at your present salary. And that was considered a big victory. Yes. Because uh, to be kept on on your present salary, this goes back to, you know, Magnum, Telling me, you know, they'd like to sign me to a contract for fifteen hundred a week. Right. And this is, you know, well before Barry Bloom started negotiating my deals post two thousand. And uh, he said, "This is just a, a carrot, you know. Next year, uh, you get double that." And I looked at him, and I said, "Magnum, you've seen me wrestle. There might not be a next year." And I did not mean for that to hit him hard because, you know, his well, career had been taken away in the you know, blink of an eye. But I think it resonated with him. And so the only time I ever recall having a conversation with Jim Hurd was he came in a few days uh, after that conversation with Magnum. And he said, Magnum told me uh, what you wanted. He thought you were worth it. And so do I. And we shook hands on the three grand a week. I never got bumped up from that, but I was able to maintain it at a time when guys were being uh, let Cut go. Tonight, like yeah, uh, contracts being gutted. Jeez, oh, I don't remember when Arn Anderson came back, but Tully, I believe, they didn't come back as a tag team. I'll, I don't know for a fact, but I believe Tully may not have passed his... Uh, that's the rumor in Innuendo. That's the rumor, and Arn's contract was cut dramatically. Now, I don't know if that coincided with Bill or not, but when you're when you're cutting Arn Arn Anderson's contract, nobody's safe. Uh, so the guys who had landed the contract extensions or the uh, Brian Pillman's one of those guys. By yeah, the way. Brian big came, cut. He got cut. Yeah, and, okay. and, and he even was told, "Hey, if you don't take the cut, we're going to beat you every night." And supposedly Pillman said, "Great, I'll be the highest paid jobber ever." <laughs> got it. And my, and my, we did a whole episode on Pillman. Yes. But I remember coming, seeing him at a house show, or maybe, I know, I started back with the company, and Brian was doing the Midnight Rider gimmick. Uh, and I see him <laughs> backstage in the Midnight Rider gimmick, and I said, Brian, I just watched the show, and they already revealed you to be the Midnight Rider. Or the Dirty Yellow Dog. One yeah, the, the dog. The yeah. dog, Dirty Yellow Dog. And he says, Cactus, at this point, I am the dirty yellow dog. <laughs> so, yeah, he was a guy, he kind of rolled with the, I guess that's, he rolled with the blows and that was a good yeah. way to ride that out. I remember when Ole took over in 1990, you know, he, uh, Ole did some good commentary, but, you know, you're supposed to be building up your guys. When you look at Brian Pillman and he says this would be a good guy for an opening or second match, and I thought, well, that's a little stiff, you know, uh, especially if you're the commentator and you're supposed to be building people. So he was not, he was somebody who came in with high acclaim, uh, had a pretty good contract, and then, like you said, they wanted him to cut it or else they were going to beat him, and he said, yeah, welcome to it. Just for the record, it was Jim Hurd who cut Arn Anderson's off. Okay, okay. Um, and when I asked Jim Hurd about it, because we found him and did his first interview in decades a couple of years ago, uh, he said he just didn't really see much in Arn and Tully. Ooh. Thought they were just sort of middle-of-the-road performers, which 
to me, tells you all you need to know about his sure view of does. wrestling. Yeah, yeah. Um, don't get me wrong. I don't think anybody would confuse Arn Anderson with the Ultimate Warrior or Randy Savage, but they're anything but bit players. Yeah, yeah, they were. Um, but I, I asked about Kip because I wanted to talk about Jim Ross because now with Kip out, it feels as if Jr. is essentially going to become the number two man behind Bill Watts in the promotion. Did you view that as a good thing for your career? I did. I did. Um, even though, you know, DDP called me with the news of Watts's, uh, uh, what did you call it, a firing? Was it a, was it a firing? It came over, I mean, we'll get to this. We're kind of jumping ahead, but. Uh, he, I think he quit. Okay. They made it clear to him that he didn't have much of a future yeah. there. And DDP called up saying, ding dong, the witch is dead. So there was some frustration with the way Bill did things that led to me not, you know, believing that, you know, things could be even better. But looking back on it, Bill Bill did a lot with me, and he was a big believer in Cactus Jack. I know when he came in, there were a lot of people really happy about it. You, you talked about Skandar Akbar and Jim Ross, all of those guys being happy that he was coming back, at least in your book. And you even said that Grizzly Smith was rubbing his hands together in anticipation of hearing the news. And he said, quote, the cowboy is going to turn this place around. So a lot of the old school guys who worked with yeah. Bill back in the day, they really had a lot of confidence in him. And considering Jim Hurd, I think he did a lot of great stuff, but it was clear he had lost the confidence of the locker Yeah, he had. Um, this has to feel like a... This is this is going to energize the locker room him coming back, right? Especially whether it was his first TV or one of his first. Uh, the taping that went down at Baltimore Arena with Ron Simmons defeating uh, uh, Vader to become the first African American heavyweight champion, yep. and I believe on that same night, the deb- debut of Jake the Snake. I'm so sorry for the burping. That um, damn rock and his damn energy. <laughs> That's right. Who'd he ever beat? And Black Adam's on that can. He wasn't last week. What flavor is this? Is this white peach this again? This is white peach again. Oh. One of the best flavors. You really can't go wrong with uh, the Zoa energy drink. By the way, as we say this, just some inside information, I, I can't get into details, but a friend of mine believes he, sus- he solved the sustainable energy uh, situation. And... Uh, wants the rock to have the secret Hmm. and so i have (laughs) recently been just on the way over here reaching out to uh brian gewertz to set up a a meeting uh so we'll find out if the energy you're not you're not kidding around no i'm not kidding around this guy i've known for a long time feels like he has the answer to the sustainable energy and if we tell hollywood's own Dwayne Johnson. That he could ride to the presidency on it. So we'll see how it plays out. <laughs> I don't know for a, I don't know whether Dwayne sense, I look I don't know if Dwayne's running for president or not, you know. If, if that were to happen, what is the likelihood we could get you to recreate Dwayne Johnson, this is your life? <laughs> Would At the you, inauguration? Would Yerpel be available? Oh, uh, Yerpel is. I'm still, I haven't been in contact with Yerpel for a couple of years. We've got to correct that. Just I do. In case. Let me just see if I can reach out to her. Wouldn't that be dramatic if we did that during the show? Do you uh, think you have the ability to do that? I'm going to text her. Well, well, let's keep talking. We don't want to distract from the thing, but I'm going to put a, a note out there to Yerpel to see if she's still there. Uh, and guys, stay tuned. By the end of this episode, we may have solved one of the world's biggest problems. Sustainable energy and uh, that'd go a long way in your household. It would. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so um, yeah. So we'll see. I was on the phone with Brian trying to set up a meeting, and we'll see if uh, what what comes to pass because of it. I gotta tell you, I, this is two weeks in a row. You've knocked my socks off. <laughs> Last week with the music video. Oh, that was and something. Today right? we're solving the world's problems. Sweeping the nation. We thought we were talking about freaking Bill Watts over here. <laughs> um, All right, boys and girls, the nights are getting longer, but the breeze isn't the only thing that's getting stiff. That's right. This episode is sponsored by blue chew guys. We all know that confidence can take you far in life. Just ask dude love, but that's especially true when it comes to the bedroom. 
when it's time to, well, you know, step up to the plate. Don't worry. That's where Blue Chew comes in. You might even say it's like a hot tag for your wiener. Blue Chew is a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredients as both Viagra and Cialis, but in chewable tablets and at a fraction of the cost. You can take these dudes anytime, day or night, so you can plan ahead or be ready whenever an opportunity arises. Now, the process is simple. You'll sign up at bluechew.com. You'll consult with one of their licensed medical providers. And once you're approved, you'll receive your prescription within days. Now, here's the best part, y'all. It's all done online. That means no visits to the doctor's office, no awkward conversations, no waiting in line at the pharmacy. And Blue Chew's tablets are made right here in the USA, prepared and shipped directly to your door, all in a discreet package. So if you can benefit from extra confidence when it's time to perform, chew it and do it. Have better sex. And we've got a special deal for our listeners. Try Blue Chew free. When you use promo code Foley at checkout, just pay $5 shipping. That's bluechew.com. The promo code is Foley to receive your first month free. Visit bluechew.com for more details and important safety information. And we thank Blue Chew for sponsoring today's podcast. You wrote in your book, it was just as easy to see why people hated him. They thought he was a bully, a tyrant, a dinosaur, and a cheapskate. Let me put the emphasis for now on cheapskate. So we sort of break, you sort of break down in your book how everybody is getting a big pay cut. Hold on one second. Yurple hyphen, it's me, comma, your old friend Mick Foley, period. Text me back if you can, period. We are planning Dwayne Johnson's inauguration and possibly reforming the Yurple slash Foley team in order to make it truly special. All right, here we go. So you can see this says your poll and there's definitely some communications there. So this is, this I, uh, is no lie, right? I can't believe what we just witnessed. <laughs> I don't even know. I'll cover up this part, right? Because we don't want to see who, if we can. Yeah, that's definitely your communication poll. between your poll. Because I was a couple of years ago, I was thinking that um, an outstanding idea for um Sustainable energy? Ac- not oh. sustainable energy. This is access, which okay. is not as important, would be to recreate that moment in the hospital where Mr. Sacco was born. I love it. And just so you don't have to be a hit with everybody. Here's one of the things about today's wrestling <coughs> uh, situation is you don't have to be all things to all people. No. In this case, you just need to be something to 100 people at who find it situation cool enough to, you know, to spend part of their budget on and that would be essentially here's your pull here's mankind here's wwe making whatever little studio space we have out to look like a hospital room do you climb in the bed no the subject climbs in the bed the fan gets, the fan in, the bed. gets in the hospital bed and uh, we've got uh, your pull we've got mr Sacco, we've got mankind I think we do a hundred photo ops. Oh, no doubt. Like that. We'll do it at the next okay. Starcast. Okay. If they Let's won't. do that. If they don't do it, we'll do it. Is, is there a chance we could get someone to hit the fan on the head with a bedpan? <laughs> with the, that could be extra. There'd be waivers. Yeah. Have to be signed. Yeah. That could be working. Yeah, bed could be it. That was a stiff shot. Yes, Steve, it was. Too. Boom. I don't know if you talked to Vince about that, but you talk about ringing a bell, right? I think there's footage of him finding the spot. Oh, did he? Like beforehand, like trying to see here, oh, this is the spot. Right? Okay. Uh, there's not too many sweet spots on a bedpan. I, you got a lot of experience with bedpans? Some. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe next week when we exfoliate your ear. <laughs> okay. Let's talk about the cowboy. Let's do. Um, it's a big change for a lot of the locker room. You even wrote in the book, Terry Taylor. Went from looking at a hundred grand raise to looking for a job. Uh, and then he's going to change some of the rules. Yeah. It's not just the money, but there's these quote unquote 10 commandments. The use of the ring barricades and ring posts is forbidden. Calls for an immediate DQ. Wrestling outside the ring is encouraged. No low blows. First offense is a thousand dollar fine. Second, second offense is a $2,500 fine. Third offense, five grand, and considered a breach of contract. Just for using the barricade or the ring post. Well, for getting hit in the ding dong. Okay, for the low blow. Okay, gotcha. Uh, if a wrestler's hit low, he has to make every effort to not sell the move as a low blow. So apparently, you got to shake it off. <laughs> Literally. 
Uh, all wrestlers are due in the building one hour before the scheduled starting of the show. Uh, fines will be implemented for being late. A thousand dollars for the first time, twenty five hundred the second time, five grand for the breach of contract for the third time. Missing an event, except in the case of the most severe injuries, is considered a breach of contract. The only excusable uh, option or exception to this rule is an act of God. Okay. Wrestlers who are injured and can't perform are still expected to make the town. In order to show that WCW is not falsely advertising the talent, unless you have a crippling injury, which doesn't allow for traveling, you can't talk over the PA. That's strongly discouraged. Lewd hand gestures are prohibited. You can't curse loud enough for the audience to hear. The fraternization between heels and baby faces in public is not acceptable. Yep. It means you can't travel together to or from the arena to public appearances. You can't go to restaurants together or even the gym. Uh, no guests are allowed in the dressing room. That means family members, media, etc. Each wrestler is only allowed two comp tickets uh, for each show. Any tickets above that, you've got to buy at the face value. And you wrote in your book... Bill Watts had some of the most dated, useless ideas and senseless rules that I'd ever heard. Now, we talked. There was no but there. No, there's no but. but. I didn't hear a okay. but. I didn't see a but. Uh, some of these rules, Jim Ross would argue, hey, you can still do all that. You've just got to make it a storytelling effect. Yeah. Well, certainly you want to cut down on your number of low blows or you know, barricade. I can understand barricade, ring post. You got to make it special. Yeah, it's kind of like when they ban the pile driver in Memphis so that when you use the pile driver. It means something. It really means something. And Bill also, he wanted the, the concrete exposed, he, no no mats out there. Um, I, I, don't, I can't remember if going over the top rope was an automatic DQ or not. But some of these things made sense, but some of them did not. And I think I even mentioned during one of the meetings uh, that uh, Nikita Koloff raised his hand and he just brought up the idea uh, where every wrestler is expected to wait until the uh, you know the end of the final match right. before they get to part. And uh, <clears throat> Nikita says, uh, uh, Bill, I understand how important it is for us to watch all the matches, but on certain nights, if we haven't been home in a few weeks, we have a chance to get home on a Sunday night. I was wondering if you might take that in consideration. And Bill goes, that's a tough, tough business on families. Any more questions? Okay, let's go. Like it just like, in there, was, out the other. there was no deliberation, you know? Yeah, you just boom, boom, nope. And uh, you know, there was also what I would say when Ole Anderson came in, like a romanticizing of the past where, mm -hmm. you know, we work 365 days, 20, you know, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And, uh, you know, Leon White asked, he raised his hand and he said, uh, Bill, you know, we had a really good pay-per-view last week. I think that was in part because we had a day off. Is there a chance that we might be able to schedule days off? And he said, we work 24, you know, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Boom. No consideration at all for whether or not your product might be better served by yeah. having the guys fresh and rested for a pay-per-view as opposed to a house show that's going to draw 1,300 people, yeah. you know, at a gymnasium somewhere. So I think there was, you know, a romanticizing of those old days with both Watts and Ole where you were, you know, the long drives – whether or not they were productive was besides the point. It was just, this is what we do. It's what we'll always do. And doggone it, you're going to like it. Your first big match uh, with Watts is uh, against uh, Sting at Beach Blast. Mm -hmm. We covered that in the archives. Was was Watts happy with it? Yeah, he was. And that was a real a victory for me um, by virtue of the fact that I was overcoming whooping cough. Yep. I think I had overcome it by then, but I, I think it was uh, Bill came in in May. I was probably still struggling with it to the point where uh, I remember Barry Windham working with me. And as soon as I get in that ring, <gasps> I would start gasping for air because I had picked up whooping cough from my son. Uh, later, the when I finally went and had all the tests done, including the, uh, the barium swallow test, it revealed that I had a hiatal hernia. That would explain why I had some stabbing pains. And anyone's yes. ever had a hiatal hernia, it feels like somebody's got a knife in your chest. And sometimes this would take place over the course of six, seven hour drives. It just could be excruciating. But I don't think that's why I was having so much trouble breathing. 
in the ring. But I remember, you know, being at Sting's gym uh, every off day and really hitting the cardio hard, really hitting it hard. Um, the spe- you know, the sp- the bike and the stairmaster. And I remember seeing Sting, and he was, oh, wow, you were working on this hard. I said, it's all for you, Sting. It's all for you, because I wanted that match to be as good as it possibly could be. It was only a 10-minute match, but at that point, it was, the I thought, the best match I'd ever had. And when I came out, Bill looked at me and goes, it doesn't get any better than that. I don't remember he said it doesn't get much better than that or it doesn't get any better than that. And even one time, uh, I, I can't remember the mistake I made. It might be in the book. And Bill questioned me about it, and I had an answer. And he goes, I thought I was going to get chewed out. He goes, ah, I know you're working as hard as you can. <laughs> so he was like, a, I was a Watts guy. You right. know, like I, you know, he, I probably he respected a, you. Right. He respected me. He liked. He didn't think the, you were half assed Right. He liked the idea that I worked hard. Yes. I mean, he was a guy. He knew what he knew when guys were going out of their way to yes. help other guys, you know, to get over. He understood that's how you have a successful company. If Bill and I were in a room, we probably wouldn't agree on a lot, you know. Uh, but I was a Watts guy, at least in '92, and so I think when I wrote about, or maybe I refer to this in the book, when DDP called me up with "Ding Dong, the Witch is Dead," I was like, "Oh, that's great." Uh, Bill really liked me. And I didn't know what the future held for me. And as I would find out, you know, uh, you know, the Watts period would be kind of, well, 91 coming in under Dusty. And then mm-hmm. uh, it, Dusty stayed there. You know, he wasn't in charge, but he was still, he was I would still say. There. He was still there. He still had some say. It wasn't until Ole came in, you know, following uh, Bill. Uh, Bischoff got the. He got bumped up. He, he got bumped up big time. To where he was like the guy we reported to, but somehow Ole slipped in again as the head booker. Eric was supposed to handle production. Ole was supposed to handle wrestling. Yeah. Yeah. And Ole just was, he still was not a fan of mine. You know, mm-hmm. I, I talked to him about it, and uh, I don't know if he was a guy who watched the product. I would say if you're going to come in and take over, one of the prerequisites is, should be you should be as familiar with everybody on your crew writers included uh, writers included yeah writers should know that you know mm-hmm. we didn't have writers at that time but we had people in charge of uh you know the b- b- we had a booking committee we didn't have a team of writers um but uh, yeah i liked i liked being under watts's employ of course very early on in watts's run uh he gets the big opportunity to have one of the best hours of tv of the year according to dave Meltzer. to your point Jake Roberts debuts, leaves Stinger Lang, and then people get a real treat. Ron Simmons wins the world mm-hmm. title, beats Vader. Did you feel like, you know, obviously we all look back with rose-colored glasses, the first ever black Af- African-American heavyweight champion, whatever you want to say, uh, a monumental moment in wrestling. Yeah. Did you feel that it was at the time? Yes. Or do we, okay. We did, and we felt it was a harbinger of, things to come from bill i mean that was one of the best it was it just one hour or was it two hours one at hour. that time it was one of the best television shows i'd ever been part of and i remember even though those two big events did not involve me i remember thinking this is good for everybody yes yeah it really was you wrote i was a va- i was a valuable guy to have around and when simmons became champion i drew the assignment of being his first challenger I was flattered to draw the assignment, but puzzled by the promotion of the match. Wides had this idea that it was important to turn the Atlanta Omni into the Madison Square Garden of the South, and as such, spend an inordinate amount of time promoting that one building. On the Saturday before the clash, Ron Simmons had a live interview, but it was instructed by Watts to concentrate on his upcoming Omni match with Rick Rude, which would be seen by a few thousand, instead of his clash match with me, which would be seen by millions. I always felt this strategy made WCW look like a Bush League regional promotion instead of a national powerhouse. Yeah, that might be a little harsh. It uh, it didn't make it look as national and international as it could. I do remember that. Uh, I mean, that was uh, the list of priorities was get the get the Omni, make it into the Garden of the South. And it was frustrating. And this would be the clash, I think, where I was injured where uh, all those elbows came back to, to haunt me. 
Um, yeah. And Ole's the referee, and you hated him as the referee. <laughs> And we're very critical of him in your book. Not a big Ole guy, Mr. Uh, hey, look, I Ole puts the Road Warriors together. Yeah. He takes a, a power lifter with a bad knee and Paul Ellering and turns him into the manager. And uh, and a lot of guys that I do like, Rip Rogers was a big Ole enthusiast. Um, a lot, he had definitely had his fans, but he, uh, yeah, yeah, I was not a, yeah, I was not a big Ole guy. As soon as my wife heard him talk to me as soon as he walked away she goes he doesn't have to come on that strong like no. you know when you're secure in your manhood you shouldn't have to treat people like that yes and he, you know the you know I, I, gruff talking and uh, it, that was his way but that was pretty intuitive my wife to just say like he's so impressive anyway you can tone it down you can tone it down a little bit you wrote of your match with ron uh, because there were no protective mats, he was on the cold, hard concrete floor. Because <laughs> Watts has gotten rid of the mats. I love cold. I landed on the concrete and pain shot through my body, the yep. likes of which I'd never felt before. I swear I thought I'd broken my pelvis. The pain was so bad, I thought I was going to pass out. Yeah, I've had to modify my answer as to what the most painful thing I've ever been through in my career. Because when you say you tore uh, abdominal muscle it doesn't resonate with people the same way that losing an ear would but i do remember just be uh, not believing anything could hurt that band bad it was like a rubber band had snapped uh and how i got in the ring to take ron's last two moves i don't know but when i came back and it was a telling of the faith the bill had in me that uh he put me on uh color with Jesse and, and Jim Ross. And I thought holding my own with those two guys and being part of that conversation, I was I was pretty proud of myself, especially due to the pain that I was in, which was just enormous. I just can't imagine being in that kind of pain and having to take a spine buster and a power slam. Yeah. But then you're back out there. Uh, you're going to do commentary for Barry Windham and Dustin Rhodes, uh, taking on the Barbarian and Butch Reed. Um, Meltzer would say, or you would write rather, at the end of the Barb and Reed's victory, the camera showed Jake Roberts nodding his head in approval as if it were some mastermind of the whole plan. That was the first and last time our foursome was ever together. <laughs> Butch Reed was fired a week later for missing a fight, and Jake the next Jeff, Jake left the next month. What could have been with that stable, oh, though? Yeah. Barbarian, Butch Reed, Cactus Jack, Jake Roberts... That's that's a pretty badass group. Could have been great. Yeah, Jake and I, we travel, I think Jake and I travel just about every every show that he was on in his uh, WCW tenure. But I remember thinking, wow, this is some kind of foursome. And then within weeks, it's just me and Barb. And Bill, I, you know, again, to his credit, he, or going to the fact that he saw something in me, uh, turned me from a guy who would have been sitting out to uh, a manager. And so I managed Barbarian while I was healing up, and I think they were some pretty uh, uh, pretty entertaining vignettes. Outstanding <laughs> vignettes. I'm fascinated to hear that you rode with Jake Roberts. Uh, I think a lot of Jake, obviously we have a podcast with him, uh, DDP Snake Pit, him and Dallas do a great job. Totally turned his life around. Are you twirling your beard because it's got the tingly it's got the oil, man. Sensation? I love it. I can't stop now. It's, oh, it's so good. It's fantastic. Oh, yeah. Foley Eddie. And especially you come out of the shower and those pores are oh, open. Man. Oh, man. brother. Oh, it will, yeah, I'm going to go tingly. home and do it when we leave here. Yeah, I would I highly advise it. Uh, you're not a partier. Right. You are not the, hey, let's go get some beers. Right. Hey, what's in your gimmick bag? Uh, none of that. Jake Roberts here in this era, probably <laughs> starting to veer out of... There's a reason why I'm laughing. I'll get to that in a second. I need to hear how that... How you two became traveling buddies. <laughs> I just... That's Oscar and Felix right there. And then we picked up uh, as soon as I got to... As soon as Jake and I were together in uh, WWE, we rode for yeah, a month or six weeks. Hey, it's definitely a learning tree experience traveling with jake when, uh, he, jake's discussed his he's discussed yes. his problems his issues there were some times when it was practically all jake could do 
to get out of the hotel and collapse into the back seat. Um, yeah, it was. Uh, I, yeah, he lived pretty hard. Hard. He lived pretty hard. And uh, the reason I'm laughing is, uh, I remember uh, Kevin Nash, who we have given credit to for his Click This podcast. Kevin maybe can reflect and give his tale. Just one day, I, I show up in the dressing room, and Kevin, he's got this gruff voice. Oh man. Oh, there's somebody get me a Percocet. And then he would hop up and give you like a short arm clothesline. <laughs> Not a real one, but... And he was basically doing his impression of yes. Jake, you know, because Jake at the time, you know, was going through a dark period. And yes. He was a little reliant on the uh, medicine, medication. Uh, but the more pivotal and instrumental moment, and this to me was that light flipping moment where he's watching Jake and Sting, and Jake had done. He, have you talked to him about the the Ali, the no cell of Muhammad Ali? No. So Bill Watts puts together the great Superdome spectacular, and it's Jake and ah oh man, one of these killer heels. Um, ah, he, he'll he'll fill you in on who it is, and uh, Ali's a special referee. And it comes time for Ali to clean house. He flicks out that jab, and here goes the monster heel taking the bump over the top rope. He flicks out that jab at Jake, and Jake, come on. And Watts chewed him out after that. Don't you understand? We bring in Ali. Muhammad Ali is the guest yeah. referee, who you're wearing his shirt with a yeah, knockout of Sonny Liston, right? And yeah. uh, Lewiston, Maine. I spent an extra $20 when I realized I was in that motel, and for 20 extra dollars, I could stay in the room that Ali stayed in when he was training for that list. Oh, fight. wow. That's cool. Fireside Inn. It wasn't in Lewiston, but it was somewhere there, and I saw 317 or 327. I said, is that room available? He goes, it is, but it's an extra $20 because of the fireplace. And I was like, Sylvester Stallone in Rocky, where he <laughs> offered the skating rink. You'll give her the place. You remember any skates? Anyway. Yes. Um, Jake told Bill, he said, he's not here tomorrow. I am. So while it may have, it was self-serving, but it, Jake was looking at it as a way to build a heel. Instead of giving him that pop, which is whatever, he's building himself up to be the guy who took the punch from Muhammad Ali. So essentially, he's kind of doing that with Sting. Yes. And Kevin's peering through the uh, the locker room door, and he turns around, and you can ask him about this. He says, or or he can reflect, Kevin, if you're out there, please give us your take on your fine show. Click this, and he goes, I'll tell you one thing. If he can get away with that, with those little skinny legs, then so can I. And Kevin, almost overnight, became a different wrestler when he started working like a big man. Because I remember there were some rides, not not specifically ones that Jake was on, but before that, where for like for two, three hours, yeah, I'm just trying to explain my vision of how he should be selling and how even if they have him losing, Kevin, you don't have to stay down. They're beating you like a drum, but you can, even if you look at, I'm not burying The Undertaker by any means, but even in that Hell in a Cell match, when the three count comes at left leg, kicks just a little bit to show you there's still some life in there yes and i just thought you can take someone's finish but you're so big you can come up mad and angry instead of just annoyed beaten, annoyed yeah like yeah he got one over on you but dog on it you know like let's see you do it again let's see you do it again and you're not hurting the baby face right the stronger kevin looks the better that victory looks for him yes uh but again i refer to it as a light flipping moment where every just thing just seems to make sense and nothing is the way it was prior and to me that was that moment because kevin saw jake kind of no selling for staying and said by golly if he can get away with it he, with those skinny legs then so can i all right, Mick, let's run a timeout right now to brag about maybe my favorite part of the day. I'm talking about going to bed. Sleep Me is the new home for Chili Sleep. We're bringing you the same great sleep that Chili Sleep offered, but under a new name. You guys know how much I've loved Chili Sleep. You know, I knew for years I slept better when I was cool. I've always had a ceiling fan in my room. I've always cranked down the AC, but I'm no longer fussing with the pillows or the the blankets. I'm at my perfect temperature every night. 
and it's all thanks to chili sleep or excuse me, sleep me. You see, sleep me makes the coldest and most comfortable sleep systems available. They create the environment that meets the body's natural need for lower core body temperatures, and it helps promote deeper restorative sleep. Now, chili sleep makes the Uller. That's what I've got. I've also got the cube and the doc pro sleep system. Either way, we're talking water-based temperature controlled mattress toppers. So these dudes fit over your existing mattress and provide you your ideal sleep temperature. And when I say ideal, I mean it. My wife likes to sleep warmer than I do. We can do that in the same bed. My side's cooler than hers. How cool is that? These mattress pads keep your bed at the perfect temperature for deep, cold sleep. And the sleep systems are designed to help you fall asleep, stay asleep, and give you the confidence and energy to power through your day. Listen, we've all had a bad night's sleep and felt the effect the next day. What if you could eliminate that? What if you were having more good sleep than bad? What if you woke up not feeling tired? That's what it's done for me. And by the way, sleep me just launched the brand new doc pro sleep system. It's got two times, two times more cold power than their other models. It's whisper quiet. And it has a tubeless mattress pad design. That's going to allow for five times more cooling contact. Plus you can pair it with that brand new sleep dot me app for enhanced device control. And what about sleep scheduling? That's right. My wife has her side turn on automatically at her perfect temperature ahead of time. It's fantastic. What are you waiting for? Head over to sleep.me forward slash Foley to learn more and save 20% off the purchase of any new doc cube or Uller sleep system. This offer is available exclusively for Mick Foley listeners and only for a limited time. That's sleep S L E E P dot M E slash Foley to take advantage of our exclusive discounts and wake up feeling refreshed every day. Let's talk about your hurt. You're managing the barbarian. You mentioned it. You wrote this while I was hurt. Cowboy bill made me the barbarians manager. I've got a hand it to bill. He kept me in the mix. Mm-hmm. The barbarian was getting a shot at Simmons on the next pay-per-view Halloween havoc 92 from Philadelphia. The main event would be the ill-fated spin the wheel, make the deal match between Jake and sting to pump the pay-per-view. We shot a series of training clips showing the barbarian to be impervious to pain. Kind of like he is in real life. <laughs> Jake and Sting shot a tremendous mini movie that turned the show into a huge success oh, yeah. financially. Artistically, it was a bust with Jake and Sting being especially hard on the eyes. A couple of days later, Jake was gone. And boy, what a terrible main event it was. But of all the options, a coal, a coal miner's, miner's glove? glove. Like I can understand when you're in coal mining territory. Yeah. But that's a fr- and I look, look, I yeah, I mean, I was maybe they thought Pittsburgh, <laughs> West Virginia, Philadelphia. I re- I remember speaking up when I was on uh, uh, <laughs> what was the Topanga and uh, Boy Meets World. Boy Meets World. Okay, you had a Topanga crush, right? Everybody. Ah, did. okay, good. Uh, I remember speaking up when they said uh, uh, that. Topanga had driven 100 miles from Pittsburgh to Philadelphia, trying to make things right with uh, Fred Savage's mom or whatever the case may be. And I kind of said, uh, it's 300 miles from Pittsburgh to Philadelphia. And they went, really? I, I used to drive, you know, I just drive to Pittsburgh every single weekend. And they didn't, if you watch that episode, they stuck with the 100, 100 even though I clearly told them ge- geographically. 300 miles. But anyway, coal miner's glove, maybe for the young Joan Johnstown, Pennsylvania area that we talked about a little bit earlier. As a national paper. Yeah, I don't No, No, don't do that. And it was probably the worst match they could have had out of all of them. Most of the fans had never seen a coal miner's glove or had any idea why this thing was going to wreak havoc. They had done an exceptional job of building it up. Hey, the stuff that I did with Barbarian, you know, I thought was really cool. Tell me how that was shot. Who helps put that together? Ah, uh, Do you recall? Jeez, I don't know who it was. Neil there. Pruitt, maybe? Uh, Neil worked real closely with me on the Lost in Cleveland. Yes. I don't know if Neil was in charge of that. It may have been. I think it was. Because, did you shoot in Atlanta? Uh, I think so. And uh, it was it was fun. I mean, to take a guy who's on the shelf, turn him into a manager. At the same time that Bill is elevating me, Paul he was not a Paul Heyman guy at all. And it was he wanted to make life as difficult on Paul as he could because he thought Paul was one of those guys who was making too much money. And I remember on this trip being. Uh, I don't mean to cut you off. Did that become the legal issue? 
I think so. There's been lots of rumor over the years as to how Paul left, why Paul left, et cetera, et cetera. And apparently there was some, maybe someone sued. Who knows? Yeah, yeah. But do you think it was a Watts Heyman issue? <sighs> well, I mean, the the no question he was being. Uh, they took away the Dangerous Alliance. Yep. I don't know if they took it away under Bill, but that was a super group to me, had a chance to be one of the, really a great faction. And it is something people recall fondly, but when you have Paul, Paul, oh, that Paul Bobby, Arn, Zabisco, Rude. Medusa, Rude, Stunning Steve Austin, this is <laughs> incredible. Can't miss. Yeah, can't miss, and they broke it up. Uh, I remember being on a road trip where we were up in Paul's neck of the woods, uh, you know, the White Plains. So I don't know where we were working that night. I was still hurt. I was in the pool trying to do a little uh, aquatic exercise. And it was, you know, Paul mentioned that I was the top manager in the company, which I guess for that month I was. And it was uncomfortable because you're with one of the great managers of all of time. All time. And he's being phased down while this guy, you know, who has no experience as a manager is is getting a push despite being injured. Your favorite of the vignettes is you in the car, <laughs> right? With Barbarian. It's got to be, right? I, I, mm, I don't know. I have to look over. I remember Barb when he went to kick the pumpkin and it didn't break the first time or the second time. And I was like, I got kids like, oh, my God, it's going to shatter everywhere. And so they had to geozimic the pumpkin just a little bit to get it to, you know, the pumpkin doesn't explode. Even uh, if I have to imagine a young Dale Doback and Brennan Huff oh, yeah. were watching. Otherwise, there's no want to do karate in the garage. There's yes. no, spa who smashed pumpkins first? Yes. It was Barbarian. Of course. Yeah. So you're back in the ring starting uh, September 25th. You're gonna I'll go out on a limb and say without our Buried Alive match, there's no burying one another alive in Step Brothers either. So I think the influence is, the Foley influence is all over that movie. Well, it's clear that Will Ferrell is a wrestling fan. I mean, oh, look look at his Ric Flair impersonation. On Eastbound Bound and Down. down. Yeah. He, he's just doing Flair from 75. I mean, right? even, woo. <laughs> yeah, I mean, all of it. The whole thing. That show's coming back, by the way. Is it really? Yeah, 2024. <laughs> Whew. Um, you're back in the um, in the rotation, or at least on the booking sheets. September 25th, they've got you uh, slated to start teaming with Jake Roberts against Ron Simmons and Nikita Koloff. And uh, Meltzer would say, I believe Jack was pretty much ordered back in the ring due to a depleted heel side. Although he was nowhere near physically ready to perform because of his badly torn groin muscle and was supposed to stay out of the ring until mid-October. Is that the way you remember it? Yeah, I did. I mean, I was off uh, for six weeks. And that was the first time I'd missed a match since missing four matches for bronchitis in 1990. Like, despite my style, I very rarely missed matches. And I, get, I did try to make it that next day. I made it to the show. Uh, and I was in such amazing pain and Grizzly Smith took one look at me getting around and he goes, no, not, not tonight. And so that was, I uh, was given some time to rest up and they utilized me as a manager. I don't remember for sure whether I was forced back in. I mean, I would have been willing to do whatever it took. I, I wonder why the heel side was so depleted at that point. I mean, Jake, uh, Jake had just left. Yeah. Jake had just left. And so... Yeah, if I was asked, I would have done it. I, I didn't drop an elbow for a number of months. It may have been up to a year. So I had to take that out of the uh, repertoire, take that item off the menu. But I uh, I got along okay, you know, learned to work around that move. You're going to start working with Sting uh, on the house shows in either Lumberjack or False Count Anywhere matches. And you guys even have a, a fantastic match on November 13th in Jacksonville. Or Meltzer would say you did a false count anywhere and you actually broke a table inside the ring and your reward was doing a job on TV for Van Hammer. Okay, <laughs> so <laughs> you had a great match with Van Hammer. We've talked about it. Yeah. Before. Yeah. That's a sentence that a lot of people can say. <laughs> well, and, well, you know, I love the idea of, you know, you have someone's faith in you and they're putting their body on the line. They're trusting you. 
and he's a heck of an athlete, and he looks, looks like a great. million bucks, and it's like, yeah, I can do something. You need Van Hamer put over? Yeah, you yeah, you can do that. And I think we traded victories. I was, I, I really, maybe I should have been a, more. Nobody, let's be clear, nobody came through bigger when, when it, it mattered, mattered less. less. And if you need Van Hammer to go look strong, <laughs> Nick Foley's your man. <laughs> uh, the Clash from the Macon, uh, Georgia show, November of 92. You're teaming with Tony Atlas and the Barbarian to take on Ron Simmons and his debuting tag team partner, Too Cold Scorpio. Yeah. So we're excited that Scorpio's coming in, but now all of a sudden you're sort of low-key managing Tony Atlas. Uh, this is a guy who's been around for a long time. Yeah. And there's lots of fun stories out there. What's your best Tony Atlas story? I know you've got one. <laughs> I, it's just the sheer joy he would take in uh, explaining why he liked to be stepped on. Did you it's, witness the act? I never witnessed the act, but... <sighs> He I was, saw in a convention in Charlotte a few years ago. I'd heard about this, never seen it. Yeah. And then I saw him sitting on a bench outside, like the front door of the hotel. And a lady approaches as she's trying to enter the hotel. He calls her over. And right there, in front of everyone, in front of the hotel, off come the shoes. <laughs> and I thought, I can't believe I'm really witnessing this. This is not in a closed door situation. This isn't in a locker room. It, this is in front of a, a Hilton. It's such a bizarre and unusual preference that it doesn't even, it just seems bizarre and unusual, not wrong, even in public. These people get their back walked on all the time. Uh, why not include the face? Can you imagine Tony Atlas making the approach? Would you mind if. <laughs> That should be <laughs> because when he asks, he's not threatening at all. No, because Tony it worked. Had a real, this was it, a stranger. Yeah, and then especially among people who knew that was his thing, it was like, like I said, it wasn't. It didn't seem wrong, right? Uh, we've heard of other acts that, all right, uh, uh, but this, he just he he really enjoyed it. And he liked talking about it. I'll tell you what, I got a whole new perspective on Tony when I saw the, uh, I didn't just see it, I narrated the first, the pilot of... Uh, Fantastic job, by the uh, way. Dark Side of the Ring. Why I didn't... Do you wish back, you hung around? What's that? Should you have kept doing it? Yes. If I had known how good it was going to be, no way would I have let Chris Jericho take that job away from me. Actually, Dutch had it, I think, the first yeah, season. Yeah, he did. And that, but I, I just thought, wow, this is such a spectacular story, Brody, like being stabbed to death by a wrestler and the show going on and all around him, you know, just a bizarre sequence of events where the, the, the ambulance doesn't get there for 45 minutes because they think it's a wrestling angle, but yeah. at the same time, they don't convict him partially because the people of Puerto Rico believed in you know bought into brody's gimmick as being the out of control wild man and jose gonzalez was able to walk away with a self-defense claim which was crazy ludicrous and i just thought man there's going to be a lot of death on this show i didn't realize they were going to have some episodes you know that were just that weren't dark by nature like the brawl for all yeah. the, uh, the you know the uh uh the the trip to north korea things like that. Uh, and I just, it's gone on to be such a great show that I look back and think, man, not only was it a lot of money for a fairly easy job, but it would have been a really great show. So I've really been happy with my appearances on Dark Side of the Ring, where I talk about Tommy Billington or Luna, and they've asked me to, if I, about my availability for a couple in the upcoming season. Um, well, I wasn't going to spill the beans, yeah, but you did. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's going to be a new season. And yeah, I mean, they they put their feelers out you, there to a bunch of people. you just going to talk about all the shows you're not supposed to talk about on Probably, this? I guess. Yeah. I don't think I was told specifically not to talk about I did this. that a few years ago, and they got really mad at me. Dark Side of the Ring did? Yeah. They're good guys, but I just casually mentioned that they were working on another one, and my phone blew up. So Ooh. we'll leave it in, though, because I didn't do it this time. You, you didn't did. do it. It's all me. Yeah. yeah. You can pass. You're Mick, Yeah. And you're now Mick they kind of, I am Mick F and Foley, right? Yeah. 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 I I there's checked. a reason why I had a middle name starting with F. So it just, 
I, there's, yeah, I don't even have to change it for uh, international documents. Just Michael F. Foley. Yes. What's the middle name? Fucking. <laughs> the rare f bomb here on Foley as well. We get one every now and again. Uh, Birmingham, Alabama, right here. Actually, we're in Huntsville. Uh, you have your only match with Eric Watts, Neil yeah. Watts' son. You're and I, the, I, I'm laughing because this is when the sleeper was outlawed. You're on the B side. I'm on the B side. This is a bill I think Bill didn't like the opponents to see each other. Like we couldn't travel together. I understand traveling, but. Walking out of a gym because Babyface is working out there. Like, I, I do recall we were on different flights even. And I was like, uh, you know, well, that's just in case a plane goes down. I said, I remember saying, so the entire Babyface side shows up with nobody to work with? Like, wouldn't it be better to have a, you know, a smattering of both sides on different flights? But I was overruled on that one. In this case... I'm doing a doing a 20 minute Broadway, you know, a, a time limit draw with Eric in a match where we can't see each other or talk to each other before a match. And so with 20 seconds to go, I call a sleeper because that seems off the cuff to be a good way to end the match with me about to go out and time limit go, you know, and then I guess Bill's uh his explanation about Eric doesn't do a sleeper. And the next week, sleepers were banned. Oh, wow. Because I had dared do it. And that was still a finish that people believed in it at that time. Like, we haven't seen. Has anyone put anyone to sleep since Brutus the Barber Beefcake? Piper beat Hogan at Starcade 96 Ooh. when the NWO was white hot. With, with a, a sleeper. sleeper. Wow. In the main event. Okay. So, how about that, Mr. Watts? But I feel strongly that saving money is important. You know, if it's not something we worry about now, boy, we are really going to worry about it later. And I want to help you get out of debt faster and do it with cheaper monthly payments. I'm talking to you if you're in a 30 year loan. Now is the time to take years off of your loan. We're routinely helping our listeners cut five, 10, even 15 years off their loan. And you can do this without perfect credit with no money out of pocket. You've just got to start at savewithconrad.com. Woo Wings, a virtual restaurant concept from the man himself, the nature boy, Ric Flair. Enjoy the legendary flavors and world championship wings by ordering with your Uber Eats or Postmates app. Woo Wings is now open in Nashville, San Antonio, Jacksonville, Florida, as well as Huntsville and Tuscaloosa in Alabama, with many more locations coming soon. Try the only chicken wings worthy of carrying the name of the 16-time world heavyweight champion. Tell him, Nate. Woo Wings, legendary flavors, world championship wings. Woo! Woo Wings. Yeah. Woo woo. Um, you are going to be involved in some shenanigans with Vader and Harley race and Paul Orndorff and Rick rude. And you're going to take a couple of splashes. Your sweatpants are going to come down. <laughs> the Foley butt cheeks are going to be revealed. What do you remember about this TV taping in Montgomery? Montgomery's where I came out and made the comeback, right? Yes. Uh, because we would have done a few tapings in a row. So, uh, I, this is specifically what I remember is uh, I am going to essentially turn babyface. Harley wanted the toughest guy he could find uh, to be part of an upcoming tag team match. And this is where Paul, Paul Orndorff, one of the great... The Thunder Cage is what they were cage, trying to right. set it up for the clash. Right. And so in order for Harley to determine who should be representing his squad, Paul and I had a match. We just had instant chemistry. Like, I did go back and I watched that match within the last couple of years. And I was like, okay, it wasn't spectacular, but everything looked good. Mm -hmm. And it was a back and forth match. And the bit, you know, the, one of the biggest compliments I've ever received is that Paul asked me if he could talk to me maybe a week or two after that first night. And he said, I just want you to know that I signed a contract with WCW. And I think it was in large part because of the matches, I think we had two matches at that point that we had that proved that he still had some gas left in the yeah. tank. And, you know, he had that nerve damage, mm -hmm. uh, noticeable, and one arm was uh, smaller than the other, but he worked that injured arm so much that it was actually the stronger of the two. Oh, wow. Isn't that incredible? At least yes. that's the way I remember it. Um, but I remember him thanking me 
because he felt like the matches we had contributed to that contract. And Paul was a, a longtime employee. When he, even when he finished wrestling, he was uh, uh, an agent over there. Um, but that match was good and solid. And uh, when I came through that crowd, knowing that this was my, uh, you know, my, uh, your real baby, I, yes. I maintain everyone's got one real turn in them in each territory they go to. I guess Big Show would be the exception that proves yes. the rule because Jericho and I, like, we uh, killed the time on a two and a half hour flight by talking about Big Show's many heel turns, heel and babyface turns. And we weren't even to the end of it when we reached the end of that flight. And that was 15 years ago. Yeah. To give you an indication. He's of... turned twice during this show. <laughs> <laughs> he's a commentator, but he's still vacillating back and forth, back and forth. <laughs> so when I hit the ring, I had what I referred to as the fear of Harley instilled in me because I knew I was coming through with a scoop shovel. And I had to use it on Vader. I was going to hit him in the back and Harley race sees me like trying to work the shovel against the wall, like a little snap of the wrist so I could pull it back a little bit. And Harley walks up to me and he goes, if you don't hit him when we get back here, I'm hitting you. And that was all I needed. So yeah. if you go back and watch this, it was Leon doing the thing with his fingers. I can't do, you know, you know, I fear no man, I feel no pain. And his, even before he got the pain, or maybe it was right after, just a shrieking. Ah! Just hit him as hard as I possibly could. Orndor feeds up. He takes a, a, a shovel shot. Harley doesn't even block with his hands. He just feeds wide open. And then Kevin Nash, as he wasn't Oz, but Vinny Vegas, and mean Mark Canterbury hit the ring. I'm expecting 10 or 12 other guys, you know, uh, you know, extras. No one, none of those guys materialize. So when I get to the back, I'm not angry because I'm kind of buzzing because it went well. I said, what happened to the rest of the guys? And Grizzly Smith told me they saw what was going on. Boom. And they bailed. <laughs> like, no, we're not. I'm not getting hit with that. <laughs> I'm not getting hit with that because I was sending it as hard as I could. And I, th I think... Uh, Mark Canterbury received a concussion because of it, and I'm sorry about that, but... Uh, you're doing it, what you're told. Doing what I was told. Uh, put the fear of Harley in me and then sent me out there. Well, you're instantly over as a big baby face, and Meltzer would write, the Cactus Jack turn was apparently a late decision predicated on Terry Funk changes his, changing his mind about coming in. Did you know that? Oh, I so, did not. had Funk come in, maybe it wouldn't have happened. How about that? I remember Mike Graham talking to me about the it, doing a babyface turn. He goes, we've got a number one guy being Sting, and nothing was going to change that. We're looking for a number two guy, and we think you can be that guy. And believe me, I'm okay with being, I would be overjoyed to be the number two guy. And I think I was en route to making that happen. You know, when, when Watts left. Watts is going to leave, as you said, uh, on the morning of February 10th. And it's announced on the 12th that Ole Anderson is going to take Watts' position. Eric Bischoff will be named as executive producer for all the TV. And uh, the company is still going to be headed by Bill Shaw as the president, Bob Dew, the EVP, and the four department heads, Sharon Sidello, who's in charge of pay-per-view, Bischoff, who's in charge of TV, Ole Anderson, who's in charge of house shows and wrestling personnel, and Rob Garner, who uh, is going to be handling syndication. And the official company statement is, Turner Broadcasting does not, by policy, comment on personnel matters. So clearly, uh, Watts did a an interview and mm. stirred up a little bit of controversy. And I think someone in the wrestling media faxed it over to Hank Aaron. And Hank Aaron obviously carried a lot of weight in the Turner organization. Uh, Hammer and Hank, one of the most prolific mm -hmm. baseball players of all time. Be also, Bay Babe Ruth's uh, all-time home record. run record. And that's it for Watts. And, you know, I, I wouldn't have guessed that you would have necessarily been a Bill Watts guy. But <laughs> here you are. You were a Bill Watts guy. and. <laughs> I think it worked out all right, okay. For it Mr. did Bob. work out, yeah. Sure, clearly, when you look at the before and after or during, Bill, I, I benefited from Bill being there mm -hmm. and did not benefit once he left. 
Well said. Well, I uh, I don't know what I'm going to do next, but I know it's going to involve at least checking out your cameo. <laughs> because every time I go on there, I don't think everybody knows this, but you can actually see a lot of these messages right there. You can. If you go to cameo.com slash Mick Foley, I ask people... Look at a few videos. It's one thing for me to say, hey, I do my best in these, but look at the videos and look at the reviews. Yes. Because the reviews more often than not are not just great job. People go into detail about how these videos made them feel because they do get the very accurate indication that there's no place I'd rather be than recording that video yes. at that point in time. And so I'm really, I'm always excited to do it. I try to deliver. So, uh, Cameo.com slash Mick Foley, uh, the Joe Doring benefit. You can go to realmickfoley.com if you're in the Chicagoland area. And then every week, tune in to Foley is Pod. And uh, don't forget this fantastic beard oil. That's, oh, I'm good, fixated. Right? I've been playing with it the whole show, <laughs> man. I love it. Uh, and they can go to mythicalbeards.com for that. And we'll be back next week, man. We're, uh, we're going to be talking about maybe one of my favorite wrestling movies of all time, Beyond the Mound. How about that? Very good. I'm up for it. I'll see you next week right here on Foley's Pod. Foley is Pod.